What does it actually mean when someone says that someone they're with is present and caring? To me, those words can be kind of slippery in what they mean. Because if you grew up ignored, abandoned, denigrated by your parents, it doesn't take very much to make you feel like someone is really with you, that they care about what's best for you. But getting this so wrong is exactly how people with childhood PTSD can spend years of their lives chasing the feeling of being utterly loved, like everybody longs for it, but longing for it from people who won't actually be with them. So my letter today is from a woman I'll call Luna, and she writes, Hi Anna, I was born into abuse. My father was a raging alcoholic, and he didn't hurt me physically, but he would hurt my mom while holding me. My mom ran away with me when I was two to the United States. Okay, ooh, that's packed with meaning right there. I've got my pencil out. I'm gonna circle things, Luna. I'm gonna read your letter all the way through so I can get the meaning, and then I'm gonna come back to the things I circled and see if I can help. All right, Luna writes, Anytime I did anything she didn't like, even though sometimes it was just basic child behavior of acting up because I was too scared of her to actually be a bad kid, she would call me my father's daughter, which really hurt. She was emotionally abusive all my life, though in recent years has finally sought therapy, acknowledged that she damaged me, and is trying to be better, which I'm grateful for, but it doesn't help that, I had, that I've had every single type of abuse a human could go through every single type. Anything bad that could happen to someone has happened to me. But the damage is done and every time I think I've healed, I enter into another relationship that models the one I had with both parents. And either I'm neglected and abandoned or I'm manipulated, controlled, put down and just actively treated like shit. I'm at the point where I'm just so exhausted. I've tried therapy, I watch hours of videos on YouTube, I journal, I meditate. I sit with the feelings. I even took this year off of dating to focus on myself after ending a relationship a couple years ago. When I realized it was the same pattern of tolerating mistreatment and accepting crumbs. I had a few dates recently with people who seem secure, but I felt no interest. And honestly, they didn't seem interested either because they never initiated a second date. I started wondering if I could meet anyone where there's mutual interest, attraction, romance, butterflies, but also safety, security, supportiveness, compassion, and commitment. I was starting to think I can't honor how I feel and will have to settle for someone I don't feel anything for. Maybe my feelings are broken and unreliable. Recently, I went into my place of work to visit. I work remotely and crossed a line with a coworker. Huh, what does that mean? I usually have no co a no coworker rule, but every time I've come into the office, he looks at me so smiley and so warm, and it's almost as if his face lights up, and it's so nice to be looked at that adoringly, especially after a string of relationships where I've been brushed off and neglected. Finally, there was someone who showed glowing interest. So this time when I visited the office, I found out he was married, and I tried to avoid him and keep my distance and keep it professional. I was bummed, of course, but I didn't think it would be a problem to avoid him. And I was doing really well until the office party, but not actually while we were there. It was at the bar a bunch of us went to after. <laughs> he showed up without his wife, and again, when I walked in, he looked back and beamed at me. Still, all night, I tried to keep my distance, but after one too many drinks, we ended up holding hands under the table in front of all our coworkers. He almost came back with me to the hotel, but thankfully drew that line, and I was angry. I felt embarrassed, and since we exchanged numbers, I angrily texted him. And he was being really apologetic and emotionally supportive in exchange, which calmed me down. I'm not used to being treated so gently during conflict. We never ended up crossing a line physically beyond the hand-holding, but we have been texting pretty much every day since that day. His wife seems controlling and sounds a lot like the abusers I've been with, but they've been together so long, have a house and a baby, so he doesn't know how to get out of it. He's tried divorcing her, but she seems to fall apart and says she'll do anything, though she never follows through. I know he can't give me the commitment I deserve, but I feel like I still can't help but indulge in the romance. 
He's more present and caring than all the people I've dated. And it's nice to finally feel important and like someone genuinely sees me and cares for me. It's nice to finally experience that romance and the emotional support. So my question is, I know that logically it's not a good idea to be involved, but how do I detach? We've both come to really care about one another, and I feel so much warmth from him. And now it's harder because he changed his position in the company, so now we will be working together directly. Whereas before, I only saw him when I was in the office. What do I do? I don't know how to say no to this. Thanks for all you do, Luna. Okay, Luna, I'm gonna go through your letter now. I've circled some things that I wanted to come back to. And let's just see if I can help you see what, what to do here. All right. So you were born into abuse with a raging alcoholic father. Didn't hurt you physically, but did hurt your mom while holding you. And I, I can only imagine what a trauma that would have been. Even if you can't remember it, it would definitely have gone in there about your sense of safety in the world and how much love there was to go around. So when you were two, she ran away with you to the US, which I guess was another country. And I guess that would have been the end of your relationship with your dad. For your mom, I'm sure it was quite a trauma having to run away and go to a new country. So she would have been stressed. And then anytime that you did stuff she didn't like, if you were just acting up like a kid, she would call you, you are your father's daughter, aren't you? And that hurt, yes, that is a huge insult. That's a projection of, by her of things that your father has done onto an innocent child. And anybody with a brain knows that of course the baby is not responsible for the father's behavior. So that is such a put down. And I know that for a lot of us who got told that, I also got told that a little bit at times, but it's like you become ashamed. You become ashamed of who you are and you're not even sure. I remember one person who wrote a letter to me some months ago said she would look in the mirror and look for her father's features and go, oh, there they are, they're right about me. It's not cool, not a good thing to do. It's emotional abuse. You went through every kind of abuse that a person can go through, every kind you emphasize. And I guess I can read between the lines of what that is. But the damage is done, you say, and every time you think you've healed, you enter into another relationship that models the one you had with both parents. All right, that's what we do. Sounds like you're normal. I'm at the point where I'm just so exhausted. Um, you've, you either get neglected and abandoned or manipulated, controlled, and put down and just actively treated like shit. Okay. So those are the two variations that you've observed before, and you're about to tell me about a relationship that you feel is different. Well, you can kind of see where I'm going here. Okay, here's the things you've tried. You've tried therapy. You've watched hours of videos on YouTube. Journal, meditate, sit with the feelings. Um, took a year off of dating. To, you've even taken a year off of dating to focus on yourself after ending a relationship. Um, when you realized it was the same pattern of tolerating mistreatment and accepting crumbs. Had a few dates recently with people who seemed secure, but you didn't feel interested and they didn't seem interested and there was no second date. All right, so what I wanted to say about that, about things you've tried, Luna, is you don't say how old you are, but I'm guessing you're fairly young, maybe in your 20s, um, because the things you've tried, they don't sound like you've gone very deep yet. And that's really hopeful because that means that everything you listed um, could have been gone a little deeper. like. You've tried therapy. I don't know how much you did. I'm somebody who didn't benefit from therapy, but many people do. But I, I wouldn't expect the depth of trauma that you've been through. Um, I, that's just something, it's, it's got so many layers. So I would really say if, if a person goes to therapy or tries journaling or meditation or anything, yes, you should expect to feel better, somewhat better. But then, you know, changing the patterns and really kind of healing the deep-rooted stuff, especially when it happened before you can remember that stuff, it just, it's a process of healing that. So what I'm saying is it's totally okay that you're not all the way healed yet. The pattern is going to keep showing up until the wound is healed. And people say that as if like, you know, oh, you bad person, you, sh you needed to go in there and heal the wound. Why haven't you yet? It's because it's mysterious. It's elusive. We, many of us actually do get that healing, but it takes a lot of persistence sometimes. It takes practice. One part of your life will get a lot better and then you'll go, oh, this other part of my life, I'm still struggling. That's the journey. Don't despair because no matter what you're going through with healing and still suffering, 
all of it is leading to the sort of deepening and strengthening of you as a person. The whole process is good. Now that you're on the other side, you're out of the bad relationship. You are on the other side now and everything here can be better. Everything can be better. So don't despair that things you've tried haven't worked. And sometimes it's the specific kind of therapy or technique that you use. Um, I know it was for me, like, you know, I tried everything. I thought nothing worked. Then I learned the techniques that I teach that are called the daily practice and boom, you know, within like two weeks, I had a huge transformation. I had a transformation that changed my, my ability to stay regulated and sort of gave me the capacity to feel happy to be alive, which was huge, but it didn't immediately solve my problems with relationships. That took practice. And, you know, what you get here on my channel is, you know, decades of experience learning the hard way how, how not to do things and what does work. And I distill it down into videos and courses and coaching programs, hoping that someone like you can kind of cut through the clutter and through the like rabbit holes that I went down that didn't work and go right to what does work. And what does work always includes an element of like facing what is really happening, just facing what's really happening. You're doing a very good job of noticing, okay, the pattern is repeating, step one, right? Why is it repeating? How does that pattern get back into your life? And that is usually getting in the, the portal for that, that bad thing to get back in and sort of twist your thinking and get you stuck in another bad situation. It comes when you're feeling magical thinking, when you're going into a fog of denial. I'm listing a number of things that, you know, people with CPTSD do. Or we've had it so bad before that like the littlest bit of niceness seems like a step up and that might be the category that I put you in. Okay. So you said, I, you started to wonder if you could meet anyone where there's mutual interest, attraction, romance, butterflies, but also safety, security, supportiveness, compassion, and commitment. I would love for you to have those things, but I think you realize that what you're doing right now is completely cutting you off from these very good goals that you have. There's no safety, no security, and no commitment for sure. And then, you know, the mutual interest, attraction, romance, butterflies, you have that. That's what it is. And what you're describing here is an emotional affair. You say you crossed a line. You didn't really say what that meant. So it just seems like you kind of flirted there. And you loved it because he had glowing interest. He was excited to see you. And, you know, I have no idea what his motives were in the beginning, but you can tell what they are now. He's having an emotional affair with you. He's getting his emotional excitement and fulfillment outside of his marriage, almost certainly because through lying to his spouse who has a baby. So I tend to be pretty hard assed about these situations. One day, perhaps you will be in a situation that you have someone you love and you have a baby. Um, and even if you don't have a baby and if somebody came along and tried to disrupt and threaten and seduce your, your partner away, it would be a terrible, terrible, terrible violation of your safety and, and just the, you know, the common understanding of what it means to be committed to somebody. So if he's keeping secret from his wife that he texts a woman at work every day, it's just, I'm so sad for her. And people get tempted, they get tempted. And if he were writing to me, oh, I would just lay into him. I'd be like, you have to stop. Like, what are you doing? He's, he's self-sabotaging on the highest level. So it's not your fault that he does that but it is your responsibility that you're participating it. You are participating in harming someone else's life. And families are fragile things. And I really, really encourage you, if you ever want to have a family or a safe and supportive and committed relationship, then allow other people to have theirs. Respect that. When you charge in and you don't respect that and you go, well, in this case, it's okay to tear it apart. It's, it's just morally and karmically a terrible thing to do. It just tends to keep you trapped in that, in that consciousness. It keeps you choosing badly. Like you need a miracle right now. You need a miracle of consciousness where you realize how worthy you are, how worth it you are to have standards and hold them. You deserve it. You need it. This is going to be the story of your life. So if you want to change that consciousness, of being cheated on, treated, treated, like how is he treating his wife? Like shit, okay? And with a baby, she's very vulnerable. 
So you're actually with somebody who is treating people like that. And if he treats her like that, even if, and it doesn't sound anything like, you know, that's about to happen, he's going to leave and be with you. I don't hear that that's about to happen. But even if it did, he would never, ever be a trustworthy partner because that's how it started. And you said you want safety, security, and commitment. This is somebody who you already have, has, he's shown you he can't do it. So just saying, you get to say no to that. Now, for people who have made that mistake that he's making, there is redemption available, but the redemption is their process, their deep process of healing. He's clearly not in that right now, all right? And people who aren't doing it right now, what are the odds they're ever going to do it? So I'm just trying to like give you that cold, cold bit of reality that you are participating in treating somebody else and like shit, and that the neglect you talk about, the um, neglected and abandoned, you, you will be abandoned. You are being neglected. He's not present for you. He's going home to somebody else every day. He's keeping you a secret. Everything has to be like under the table. So you are being neglected and you're abandoning yourself. Like he can't abandon you because he's not actually with you. You're abandoning yourself and what you most want. And, you know, I just totally understand. I, you know, I've actually been in every role in this thing, you know, <laughs> I've been in every role in this drama, all of them. And I know what it's like to be each person. And it's a terrible place to be for everybody concerned. And it's doomed. I'm just calling it. All right. When you were angry and texting at him, there's your true self. You know, you were mad at him for, you know, getting involved, seducing you, using his friendliness to draw you in and hold hands. I'm angry at him too, but I want you to kind of like take, I want you to totally turn your focus to yourself and how you are letting yourself down. And you angrily texted him after that. You have anger at him. Okay, time to set the, if somebody treats you like that, now is the time you set the bar. What we do with CPTSD is we turn back around. We're like, how dare you treat me like that? And then they go, oh, sorry, you know, can we still stay connected? And we go, oh, okay. And that's that little switch. That's the moment when the evil gets in. That little switch flips and we go, oh, okay. And isn't it like, it's like you've been drugged or something, or it's like being a zombie. I, when I see zombie TV shows, I'm always like, that's kind of what it's like when you're in a terrible relationship. And they can bite you. and suck you into their their horrible drama and so you want to run away you want to get away you do not want to become that so he was being really apologetic and emotionally supportive in exchange um, which calmed you down and you're not being used to being treated so gently during conflict so okay tough love fairy just needs to say to you you were not being treated gently you were being used and exploited for emotional as an emotional pick-me-up for a guy who's in a stage of life that can be very hard and bleak. It's notoriously hard to have a new baby. It's hard for a couple. It's hard for an individual. The, the, the reality of the lifetime of responsibility is just coming down. And it is a time when partners, particularly the one who didn't just have the baby physically, are, are, are prone to roaming. They're also prone to abusing their partners. And I'm not saying at all that's what he's doing. He's not physically abusing her. But it's a, it's a vulnerable time. And so luckily you never slept with him. I hope you haven't since you wrote me this letter. Okay, here's where you go. His wife seems controlling and sounds a lot like the abusers I've been with, but they've been together so long and they have a house and a baby, so he doesn't know how to get out of it. Okay, this is where you're kidding yourself. Do not criticize his wife, all right? You don't know her. It's none of your business. He's going to say whatever he needs to say to justify his behavior. It's not your, like, stand with your sisters right now. Don't, don't criticize her. In fact, a woman with a new baby has to be controlling and has to be like, I need you to get home. I need you to bring food home. I need you to, sp to give me some time off so I can get some sleep. So this, um, he doesn't know how to get out of it. Honestly, everyone knows how to get out of a relationship. He does know how to get out of it. But instead of getting out of it, he's trying to just take a little vacation with you. And if you were somebody who was like, I would just really like to have a secret emotional affair with somebody that doesn't mean anything and then just move on from there, it, it would be no problem for you. But you're not that person. You want something better. You have this whole history of getting your heart ripped out. And it's coming. It's coming for you again. You can head it off before you lose any more 
you know, sleep or love or dignity around this. You can head it off and cut off contact right now. You say he's more present and caring than all the people you've dated. So I'm just saying, Luna, with the people you've dated, that's not saying much. He pays attention to your emotions, but he still exploits you. Um, I'm not trying to make you a victim here. I just feel like in an emotional affair, um, two people are, are, are doing that. You're a grown person. You have all the abuse that makes you vulnerable. I don't know what he's got, but everybody's vulnerable. But we all have to account for ourselves and just decide, where do I draw the line on what I get involved in? You can't help but indulge in the romance. Of course, you want to escape. It's so lonely not having a partner when you want one more than anything. It's really hard to get through. I often use the metaphor of food, like you are so hungry, you need dinner, you need dinner. And someone has said, here, here's some cotton candy. <laughs> Or how about, here's, here's a plastic apple. That's what I call uh, emotional affairs sometimes. It's a plastic apple. It looks so pretty. And it just leaves you so hungry. Nothing, you know, it just, in fact, you don't even go get anything proper to eat because you thought you already had it. You trick yourself into denying yourself of the very thing you need. So there will always be people who will play along with you if you're willing to escape reality and eat plastic fruit and candy for dinner. There will always be people who will accompany you on that. So we can't wait for them to change. We've got to have the boundary ourselves. When you have that boundary, nobody's going to get even close to you with that sort of agenda. The only people who will get your attention are the ones who meet the standards that you are aware of, that you've written down, that you've set for yourself. And then, and from there, you can start to have the hope of a relationship proceeding toward commitment, presence, truly caring, love, okay, compassion. You know it's logically not a good idea to be involved, but how do I detach? So this is, people often say this, like, how do I do it? And I know you know on some level, but I'm just going to go through it. You stop meeting with him face to face. The work thing is a, is a problem, but first of all, you must cut off any sort of personal contact. You will never text him again, okay? And so whatever is the most private way to say in one or two sentences, no more, no emotions, no, I'm sorry, no, it grieves me to do this, just plain old. I realize um, that this is a really unhealthy thing to do and I need to end our relationship. Please don't text me anymore. Then what you do is you set yourself up to cope with the withdrawal that you're going to go through. Because basically an emotional affair is like an addiction. It's a thing that you have to keep chasing to get a hit off of it. And the hit never does the trick. It never fulfills anything. And so you're going to go through a withdrawal. It's going to first bring up a lot of grief from the past, from the present, a lot of anxiety about the future. That is why, you know, grief, anxiety, anger that this is happening again. It's not fair. You got treated in this bad way as a kid and it primed you to have this kind of relationship and to not see it coming and to have trouble getting out. But now you can just act as if you do. You've always been the person who knows how to get out. So you cut off all contact and you then deal with your, you, you set yourself up. And how you set yourself up to deal with the withdrawal is you're going to need people and love. You're going to need friends. If you don't have friends and family who can support you right now, and that's often the case with people with CPTSD who are right now in a sort of, you know, um, emotional affair, a limerent relationship, then 12-step fellowships are great. You could go back to therapy too. Can you afford it? It's time to like for real in a sustained way, in a way where you have contact with supportive people every day. Could you do it every day? You could have therapy once a week and go to meetings three days a week and make a friend in a meeting who you take a walk with on Sundays, that type of thing. Like put your very highest priority is to heal this wound. And there's no better time to heal, a, to heal that attachment wound than when you've just had your heart broken. And in the days that I've had, in the times that I've had my heart broken, when I was going through those times, I thought it was the worst time in my life. When I look back on those periods, it was the best time of my life. There was so much growth, so much awakening. But I often had to, you know, really like not get what I wanted and feel pain in order to wake up to reality, to go, wow, you know, I have a pattern. I want to change the pattern. And I wish I was somebody who would just like do the right thing and figure it out like immediately, but I never have been. I have been prompted towards all my healing efforts by being in pain like you are right now and like you will be if you, if you go ahead and cut this off. So then what you do, all right, so you work with the guy and he's now been moved close to you. 
you are not obliged to leave your job over this. Nobody is. But because you know that you want to heal, you want to heal and that being around him is always going to be a temptation. It's always going to be like pulling off the band-aid. I strongly encourage you to take care of yourself by finding somewhere else to work and making it so that you never, ever bump into him. He's poison to you. And it's this weird thing, you know, uh, I, I, I've, I've met people who had lost their eyesight from drinking bathtub gin, you know, that they had to make themselves. And you know what? They want to drink it again. <laughs> they want to drink it again. And uh, there's brain damage in it. Actually, a lot of people in my family, you know, have lost their lives over drugs. That's what addictions do, is that it just seems like you've got to have it. But if you really, really, really want to save yourself from the path that this will take you down, and the path that this kind of pattern will take you down if you don't really commit to changing, just like making a change and committing to supporting yourself to make that change, the path keeps going and it doesn't tend to naturally get better. I know of people who are there, like one day they met somebody really great and they were okay, but I can hardly, I can think of one or two. I can think of hundreds of people who I've met and worked with where the opposite was true, where, you know, it happened once, it happened twice, it happened three times. Soon they had a hard time changing the pattern at all. Their self-esteem got so eroded, their financial situation was so damaged from you know, being so dysregulated and upset um, from not, you know, there is certainly a financial benefit to having a partner. Not everybody has one or needs to have one to be stable and safe, but you need to be stable and safe. And I don't want you to take that energy that you are craving to use in a partnership and keep throwing it away on impossible cotton candy, plastic apple men. All right. So if anyone is relating to this topic and you want to hear more, I have a video about the toxic love of unavailable partners. I have that video for you right here, and I will see you very soon.